Que, bienvenue, bienvenidos. Welcome as we come together to on the third Sunday after Pentecost, on a day that we've dubbed as Stewardship Sunday. We've named it this as we continue to reflect together on the gift of community, a title inviting us to consider our call to be people of service to reflect on our gifts and how we can share our talents with one another. In many ways, it's an extension of thanksgiving, a time to consider how we can put our gratitude into action in acts of kindness, compassion, and love. Now, we're called together in love as a community of friends and faith, and so I'm grateful to be sharing my gifts with you. Uh, my name's James Ravenscroft, and I'm doing... Uh, sharing these gifts with Amy D.L. and Bob Rose and our senior choir and Teresa Roberts. And of course, all of you as we come together, both on site as well as online and this week uh, on the air with V-O-W-R. So a special welcome if you are worshiping with this community for the first time. And a heads up for those of you who are listening on VOWR, we're a week behind uh, in the gospel readings we've chosen, so it may be a bit deja vu for you. But no matter the readings that we reflect upon, we are here through the Spirit calling us together. And so we light our candle. May we shine with God's love. And that love is embodied in the world as we seek justice and strive to live as good relations. In that spirit, we give thanks for the land upon which we gather. Give thanks for the air and the water and the plants and the animals and give thanks too for the first peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial, acknowledging the Beothic, whose culture has been tragically lost, and the Mi'kmaq, in whose traditional and unceded territory we gather, we commit to walk with indigenous peoples in this community and with all who call St. John's home. And in that same spirit, we strive... Oops. Sorry about that. My tablet went whoosh. In that same spirit, we strive to make St. James United Church a safer space for all people. No matter when you were born, where you are from, what your abilities, how you identify, why you are here, or whom you love. Everyone belongs. And in that spirit, we invite you to be yourself. Uh, if you need to move around or fidget or take a break, whatever you need to make yourself be you, just be you. <laughs> And friends, in that spirit of inclusion and belonging, let us now greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace, conscious of each other's comfort, and so perhaps to offer a wave or a bow, a fist bump to those around us. May the peace of Christ be with you. And peace to everyone who is online.
So let us join in our call to worship. We have come to worship to what we often call a service. We have come because we want to serve God. But it's a service of worship all that God asks of us. No, we come to worship to learn how to serve God. And that service often makes little sense to this world. We serve the one who creates abundance by sharing. We serve the one who came as a baby by walking with the vulnerable. We serve the one who restores peace to our hearts by being people of peace rooted in justice. Let us worship God. Let us worship through our service. Let us pray. Spirit of grace and blessing, we have come to worship in order to serve you. Show us then how to serve, reminded in your holy word of how to follow one who came to serve, not to be served, of how to imitate the one who gave his life that we may live. Help us to have a clearer understanding of discipleship and so to see it as a gift that transforms our lives. We pray in the name of the one we serve by serving. Amen. And so we join together in singing in loving partnership we come. That's Voices United, number 603. That's the Reddish Hymn Book, 603. Arise as you are able and take what posture you wish to, uh, both at home, whether it is online or on the air.
As we come together, first want to acknowledge that our bulletin has been dedicated in memory of Dot Hapgood, uh, from Susan, Stephen, Rebecca, and Kyle, as well as in memory of Jacob Parsons from his wife, Etty. And I also want to offer a word of thanksgiving uh, to all who... Let us pray. O divine word first spoken to bring forth the gift of life, speak once more into our hearts, bringing peace where once was confusion, bringing direction when the path ahead is unclear, that in your wisdom and grace we may be faithful followers, walking in love as we embody the way of Jesus. Amen. Our first reading is from Romans, a unique, unique letter in that Paul was writing not to a community that he helped start, but one he wanted to visit. This is why his letter is so theologically complete, more like a pre-visit sermon than a recap of previous teachings. This is a reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 to 18. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Pursue hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is a word of wisdom from the apostolic community. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Our gospel portion jumps ahead from where we left off two weeks ago when Jesus sent his disciples out to villages in pairs. Since then, he has fed a multitude twice over, healed a number of people, even revealed his glory to his closest disciples on a mountaintop. Despite all of that, his disciples just didn't get what he was about. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. 
they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, Look, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and be condemned to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. Later, James and John, sons of De Zebedee, came forward to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you'll be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to appoint but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they were angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is a word of wisdom from the early church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our final reading returns to a book we read from two weeks ago on Thanksgiving from contemporary American humorist, novelist, and activist, Anne Lamott. This is from Help, Thanks, Wow, The Three Essential Prayers. Selections are from pages 60 through 65. Saying and meaning thanks leads to a crazy thought. What more can I give? We take the action first by giving, and then the insight follows that this fills us. Sin is not the adult bookstore on the corner. It is the hard heart, the lack of generosity, and all the isms, racism, and sexism, and so forth. But is there a crack where a ribbon of light might get in, might sneak past all the roadblocks and piles of stones, mental and emotional and cultural? How can something so simple be so profound? Letting others go first, in traffic or in line at Starbucks, or even if no one cares or notices. Because for the most part, people won't care. They're late, they haven't heard back from their new boyfriend, or they're fixated on the stock market. And they won't notice that you let them go ahead of you. They take it as their due. But you'll know, and it can change your whole day, which could be a way to change your whole life. There really is only today, although luckily, that is also the eternal now. And maybe one person in the car in the lane next to you, or in line at the bank, or at your kid's baseball game will notice your, general ca your casual generosity and will be touched, lifted, encouraged. In other words, slightly changed for the better. And later, we'll let someone else go first. And this will be quantum. This is a word of wisdom from the global community. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. And so let us sing together, God is here, Voices United 389. That's the Reddish Hymn Book 389.
amen to that prayer we just sang together. I have to say that I'm often struck by how on the nose Jesus was in his social analysis. Speaking about leaders lording it over others. His words aren't surprising since it was common in the Roman Empire for some to be lords or masters and others to be their doulos, slaves. As many as one in three people were enslaved and as many were formerly so, had been freed. And Jesus' world was a very stratified one with one class lording over another which in turn lorded over another, and so on. And yet, as I look at our world, I realize that, well, I don't think a whole lot has changed. Even in countries claiming Christian heritage, despite having 2,000 years to reflect on the teachings of Jesus. At times, it feels like we're stuck unable to imagine any way of organizing ourselves other than a model where power is something we exert over others. And even if the goal is something good, it's what we hear in James and John as they ask Jesus to sit at his right and at his left. That is in positions of authority just under the ruler. And they've all seen the good that Jesus has done, so it's unfair to assume that they have unsavory motives. But James and John believed, despite what Jesus said about his impending suffering and death, that he was about to usher in a political kingdom. Benevolent or not, they are picturing having power over others. Proof that they just didn't grasp what Jesus was about. And even now I wonder, do we grasp what Jesus was about? Because we put off the reshaped world that Jesus was calling us into for 2,000 years. Consider what he said to James and John about sharing in his baptism. He meant the cross. He meant his life given in ransom. And what does this mean? Well, it ties into his words about slavery because ransom is a price paid to free someone from bondage, to free someone from enslavement. And we were enslaved, frankly, still are, in bondage to lording it over others, in bondage to exerting our power over others at their expense. But Jesus was inviting them into a baptism that could reshape the world. Not John's baptism, related to it, but John's baptism was about letting go of past wrongs without necessarily changing the patterns of power that enabled those past wrongs. Jesus, on the other hand, was calling his disciples to die to the patterns of power in the world and reshape it in a way that models another way of being, a way of serving others. Now, it's riskier than we may realize, especially if in that world you're someone of a higher status serving someone who was lower. But Jesus' baptism was about imitating this radical way of being so much so that we imitate one who gave his life to set us free in the present, in this world. And yet, what have we done? We turned baptism, a la James and John, into a guaranteed spot in a future heaven. Let's not worry about reshaping this world at all. And I think we do this because many of us, me included, we kind of like the way things are. We like the idea that Jesus makes, that baptism makes us like Jesus. 
But what ends up happening is we turn Jesus into us and not the other way around. Here's a good example. Uh, Jesus' job was a tecton. It's a Greek word, and when we hear tecton, we assume he must be an artisan furniture maker, making the finest cabinets for everyone. But tecton is more often a heavy laborer and very likely an enslaved person. So did you know that there's a theory that Jesus was once enslaved? Now, it's a fringe theory. It's posited by Dr. Mitzi J. Smith from Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. And it's based on Mary's dialogue with the angel Gabriel. She ponders if Mary called herself God's doule. She called herself that because of her literal status as a doule, a female doulos. If that's the case, it explains Jesus' missing years because a child born of an enslaved person is in turn enslaved. Now, there was a law that that child born to an enslaved person would be set free at the age of 30. Huh. Jesus shows up at 30. It explains, too, why he was executed by crucifixion a mode of death reserved for two kinds of people, political agitators, that's what I usually think, and slaves. It also clarifies Philippians 2, the hymn that says Jesus emptied himself of his status in God to take the form of a slave. Now, again, I'm not saying that this is true. We have no way of proving it, but... I find it intriguing. And if he was a freed slave, it somehow makes his social analysis and his teachings about power, it makes them so very real. And it makes me less inclined to want to spiritualize his teachings. I'll give another example. The story just prior to this one, which I preached on at Gower, where Jesus tells the rich young man to sell all he owns and give it to the poor. Now, I've heard plenty of preachers say, me among them, oh, he's not talking about money. He's saying, don't let anything impede you from following Jesus. But retelling it that way lets us off the hook about reshaping our economics. And the same happens when we reduce his words about being slaves to each other to just be kind. Imagine if we took his words about servitude more literally. What happens? Well, first, think that he's speaking to all of us as his followers, which means we're all to be serving each other. No one is solely above another, because as, as I'm a doulos to you, you are in turn doulos to someone else who is in turn doulos to them and so on and so on. And so all the power over that we're so beholden to in our world collapses as instead we have a consistent sharing of power that removes hierarchies, a flattened world where we can no longer lord it over others. Can you picture that? Like, really picture what that looks like? Paul suggests what it might look like in Romans 12 when he says that we should make love our purpose as we forgive each other, as we lift each other up, as we let go of self-interest, as we extend hospitality, hospitality without exclusion, as we don't worry about someone being of a lower status than us, and overall as everyone lives in harmony and in peace. Now, that is a world I want to live in. And I believe we can, because Jesus' initial statement, though about leaders in his society, he shifted it as he pointed to his disciples, and he said, the reshaping of the world starts with you <laughs> as you serve, as you are 
an enslaved person to each other. If each of us takes our call to serve each other seriously, the world shifts. It doesn't necessarily come naturally, certainly not in a world where we see around us a Lord and over others model of doing things, but through grace, we do receive Jesus' spirit, and we learn to die to ourselves for others, letting him take over as more often than not we start to put the needs of others before our own. Now, I don't mean we should do this exclusively because we do still live in a not flattened world and people do take advantage of others' kindness. We do need to look after ourselves. But we need to start somewhere, don't we? And as we do, the impact is profound. As Anne Lamott writes, when we start living this way, well, many people won't notice, but some will. And even if they just notice it subconsciously, they'll in turn serve another. And that person will serve another, and so on, and so on. And as we do, we embody the baptism of Jesus and shape the world as he taught us, a world not about power and lording it over others, but a flattened world that's all about love. Amen.
Thank you, choir. That was awesome as always. So let us pause now in prayer, holding in our hearts the need of our world as well as the needs of those closest to us. Holy One, we give thanks for this day, for the gift of coming together in faith-filled and faithful community. We need the witness of what loving and supportive relationships can be, even as we admit that we do not always live them fully. The dynamics of our world model a different way of being, a way of power exerted over others and not Jesus' way of service. As a result, we see a protracted war in Ukraine, an escalation of the war in the Middle East as Israel launched an attack on Iran. So we pray for peace. We pray for a ceasefire that enables both humanitarian aid to the people of Gaza and for Israeli hostages to go home. And we see our addiction to power over others in other ways, O oh God, in terms of gender, tragically evident in the femicide of a young woman in Ottawa. And so we pray for her children, for her community, for women everywhere as we seek to shape a world where equality becomes our norm. And we pray for the same in terms of race relations in Canada and around our world, especially as we listen to dehumanizing rhetoric about migrants in the U.S. election, and even here in Canada, where Canadians have started to sour on immigration and quotas have been slashed. We pray for a world where we can turn toward rather than away from one another, where we can serve one another with respect, with care. And so we pray for the same here in our community as we share our gifts with each other and find ways to build each other up in love. And one way we do this is by reaching out to those of us in need of support and compassion. And so we pause in prayer for those of us who are sick, who are facing life-limiting illnesses, who are in hospital and recovery at home, who are feeling lonely and overwhelmed. We remember any who are grieving, especially Maxine and her family, as well as the family of Margaret Day and others who are known only to us. Be with them, O oh God, and all who are facing the sadness of recent bereavement. And let us pause now in silence as we recall our own personal concerns. We lift all these to you, holy God, as we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so we join together in our concluding hymn, O Jesus, I Have Promised, a voice is united 120. I invite you to rise as you are able. Uh, take whatever posture uh, from home, whether it be online or listening to VOWR.
We are called to be people of hope, a community of God's beloved living in the spirit of Christ, God's chosen community sharing in service of God's reign. We do it in the power of love, blessed in God, Abba, Christ, and Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.